Then, then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even into the reign, the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Thus the, house that, thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning at Forge Road Bible Chapel. And this morning, I'd like to tell you a story. It's a story about something that happened 2,000, about 2,540 years ago. Actually, and more specifically, it's a story about something that happened 2,539 years Seven months, two weeks, and two days ago, counting from today. It is a story that is largely about two men who were different in almost every way. You can think of them as sort of like the odd couple of biblical history. One man was old. He was in his upper 80s, maybe even 90 years old. He talked a lot about the past. And his attitude towards life might be summarized by, with the words, I've seen it all. And the other man was young. He was either in or just out of his late teens. He talked all about the future. And his attitude towards life might be summarized by saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. The young man was from a very well-known, well-connected, and famous family, and he could trace his blue blood lineage back generations. He could trace it back centuries. The old man was from a family that was so obscure that even in a Bible that is full of genealogies, we can't go back one generation. We don't even know who his father was. The old man had a gruff, straightforward, plain-spoken way of talking. Listening to him was about as subtle as a punch in the nose and a kick in the pants. The young man was full of ambiguity and innuendo and suggestion, and so much so that the people then and people today aren't quite sure exactly what it was that he was talking about. But these two men would share a common passion. And what they would do together would change their city. It would change their nation. It would be reported up the ladder of political authority until it reached the ears of the most powerful man on earth. What they would do together would set the scene for the greatest change that has ever come upon the world. And it all would happen, what they would do together would all happen within the span of one year. According to tradition, those two men are buried side by side. And we are still talking about what they did, and their story is still being told. 2,500 39 years, 7 months, 2 weeks, and 2 days after it happened. So open your Bibles with me, please, to the Old Testament book of Ezra, chapter 4. And this morning we are beginning a new series of meetings. We're going to be covering together one year of biblical history over these next four weeks, what they called the second year of Darius what we call 520 B.C. or B.C.E. as you prefer. It is a year that was meticulously documented in Scripture. Today we're going to cover the events of the sixth month, and our key word is renewal. Darius is the king of Persia. He was Darius I, Darius the Great, the architect of the Persian Empire. Darius was not born of the royal line. He, he led a group of seven nobles that staged a palace coup. 
seized power and then went about building and establishing and expanding the, the Persian Empire into the Colossus that we read about in the history books. Joel Leininger had a series last year about the book of Esther. The king in the book of Esther is the son or maybe the grandson of Darius and the capital city where the events in Esther take place and where the book of Nehemiah starts, that city was built by Darius. Such was his power and his influence that much of civilization reckoned time according to the years of his reign. Now Darius would be surprised, I think, to learn that the events of his sovereignty that are most impactful on our world happened in its second year in a small corner of his empire in Jerusalem where after a long time of prophetic silence and a pretty much nothing happening, suddenly, unexpectedly, the Spirit of God began to move. And suddenly there came forth a burst of prophecies that reached the hearts and the minds of God's people and sparked a new beginning in their history. One that is celebrated not just in their journals, but also in their songs. It had been there 86 years before in 606 BC that Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Chaldeans, the instrument of God's judgment, God's battle axe, the Lord called him, had conquered Judah and Jerusalem and made King Jehoiakim his vassal and started to deport the Jews to Babylon. Beginning with the best young nobles like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The word of the Lord by Jeremiah was that Jerusalem and Judah were to subject themselves to Nebuchadnezzar, but they would not. Eight years later, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Jerusalem. He deposed the then king Jehoiachin, he carried away the treasures of the temple, he took captive to Babylon about 10,000. The officers, the valiant men, the craftsmen, the smiths, he left the rest of the people and made Zedekiah king over the poverty that remained. Again, the word of the Lord by Jeremiah told them to submit to Nebuchadnezzar, and again, they would not. In 589 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar returned to Judah, smashing city after city until reaching Jerusalem where the wrath of his power broke down upon it like the dread fury of the judgment of God. He had Jerusalem besieged, shut in, starved out, torn down, burned up. He would have bulldozed it if he had had the technology. The entire city was destroyed by fire, and the temple built by Solomon was demolished down to its foundation. And now Nebuchadnezzar deported essentially everybody. The one-third of Jerusalem's population that had survived the siege and almost everybody in the country, almost two million people. He did so with the intention of ending this rebellious city, ending this nation, ending its history, ending its culture, and ending any living memory of its God. When we pick up the story again, it is 537... B.C., and 70 years has elapsed since the captivity began. And like clockwork, the king of the day, now Cyrus of Persia, is again the instrument of the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord. And Cyrus sends out a decree to whoever might be left in any place in my empire, who's ever left to return and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The Spirit of God moves, and 42,360 people assemble to make the journey back. Two million people were deported. 42,360 are coming back. That's about 2%. The vast majority had given up on the promises of God and had disappeared into the secular culture of cosmopolitan worldliness was that, that was the Babylonian and Persian empires. 
But as Isaiah had written, and as Paul later quoted, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and would have been made like Gomorrah. There would have been nothing left. But a constant throughout the biblical narrative is that there always remains a faithful remnant of Israel as there is one today. And now it is stepping out vividly into history. To me, those who hung on through the captivity are among the greatest heroes and heroines in the Bible. They, through generations and against impossible odds, kept the faith, believed the promises, studied the scriptures, raised their children in the truth, and never gave up hope. They, through their faith, persevered, and by persevering, they overcame the greatest empires the world had yet seen. It is of them, of the remnant in the captivity, that the author of Hebrews refers in chapters 11, chapter 11 as those who, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong. You can even recognize famous events from the captivity in those words. Daniel and the lions, Hananiah, Ishmael and Ananiah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, surviving the fire. Consider the lessons that we can draw from those faithful men and women as they assemble to make their journey back. You know, when the nation was um, exiled by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that took some administrative doing. I mean, how exactly do you go about deporting two million people and removing them a thousand miles away from their home? Well, this is how they did it. The order went out for the people throughout the nation to assemble at the city of Ramoth. You might remember Ramoth. Last year, we did a series on the life of Samuel. Samuel was born in Ramoth, lived, died, was buried in Ramoth. And now it becomes the city where this defeated people came to taste the full measure of their defeat, like so many ancient nations before them, to form up in Ramoth for the long journey into exile. You know, a place can become so attached to a happening that just its name conjures up the emotion of the event. In our history, think, for example, if I were to just say Valley Forge, where President Herbert Hoover, now there's a president who doesn't get quoted a whole lot, where President Herbert Hoover in the days of the Depression went to Valley Forge to give a speech to rally America. He called Valley Forge our American synonym for the trial of human character and the symbol of the triumph of the American soul. If those few thousand men endured that lone winter, humiliated by the despair of their countrymen and deprived of support save their own indomitable will, what right do we have to be of little faith? Good words for Americans, then and today. Well, just as Valley Forge would become the synonym for American character, Ramoth now became the synonym for Israel's great loss, heartbreaking loss, seemingly irredeemable loss. Everything that you have, everything that you ever have had, is gone. Everything that you've worked for, everything that you've saved, it's like the dust blown in the wind. To put it in modern dress, your home, your car, 
your bank account, your possessions, your investments, your 401k, your 403b, the plates, the pots, the pans in, 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 in your kitchen cabinets, your children's bicycles and their toys, it's all gone. Everything sacred has been destroyed. And you and your spouse and your children have nothing more than what you can carry in a suitcase. Imagine you and your wife or you and your husband packing that suitcase and making your sad transport to Ramoth, assembling there with other families and other communities and from Ramoth starts a walk of 1,000 miles towards what? And now the crowd is moving. And now you're doing nothing more than putting one foot in front of another because what else are you going to do? I know that this morning I am speaking largely to an audience that is very biblically literate. And you might already be thinking of how this scene is vividly portrayed in a famous verse from Jeremiah. But it's a verse that's famous in another context. So maybe we don't make the connection. See if you recognize these words. A voice was heard in Ramoth. Lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel was the wife of Jacob, who so wanted children. And she, when she was not able to conceive, she, she cried to her husband, Give me children or else I die. And the Lord heard her cry. And she became one of the mothers of the nation. She had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph had two sons born to him in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh. And they became two of the tribes of Israel because Joseph got the double portion of a firstborn. Rachel's posterity ran through Ephraim. The city of Ramoth is in Ephraim. You might remember Jack Terzu's message from the Samuel series. Hannah, Samuel's mother, lived in Ramoth in the hills of Ephraim. And here Jeremiah pictures Rachel as a mother looking over the generations, mourning over her children and her children's children who are being violently taken from her and from their land, and she's never going to have them again with a weeping and a mourning that is so bitter she will accept no comfort. Matthew, as I expect you know, uses this verse for the cries of the mothers whose children were taken from them and slaughtered by Herod when he tried to kill the one that was uh, born of Mary. And now... 42,300 people, 42,360 people are coming back the other way. We have just come out of a fine series of meetings called The Two Ways, taken from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, contrasting two different types of life. Jack Terzu spoke about two trees, which bear good and bad fruit. Kyle Sobis spoke about two builders. And Joshua Gorman spoke about two roads, two paths, one broad and full of people, the other narrow and few on it. And I was in my weeks of study for this series when I heard Joshua's excellent message he talked about how no one is on the narrow way by accident. No one is on the narrow way because he follows the crowd. Nobody stumbles into the kingdom of God. Nobody wanders through the narrow gate. The narrow way is purposeful. It is intentional. 
And as I heard him, I thought of these two processions, separated by a generation, but bound together by history. The road out of Ramoth was wide and broad, and there were millions of people on it. And those who traveled it did so just because they did, just because they were moving forward, because the crowd was moving forward, or because what else are you going to do? They were headed towards a distant de destination where, where, that none of them could see and where none of them wanted to go. The people on that road were depressed and forlorn and angry. I think there was a lot of anger on that road. Angry at Nebuchadnezzar or angry at the fate assigned to them by God. Personally, I would have been angry at the stupidity of Zedekiah. Bang up job as king, guy. But nowhere to channel that anger. And I suspect that most of them were just numb. The road was dreary and sad and hard, and in the midst of two million people, it was still lonely. And such is life on the broad way that leads to destruction. Those returning, those on the narrow way and the few that found it, well, they knew exactly why they were on that road. They were on that road by choice. They knew where they were going. They knew why they were going. The Spirit of God was among them, and although the way was hard, they were encouraged, and they were hopeful, and they were singing as they went. There were 200 men and women who were designated to sing on the journey. Their journey was purposeful. It was intentional. Their companions on the journey shared the same purpose and shared the same intention. They were all going together, and they're all going as families, by the way. Ezra's prayer, when he sets out with his group in Ezra chapter 8, is that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and for our little ones. And such is life on the narrow path that leads to life. The path may be difficult, but there is nothing in the world better than being on the narrow way. This body of people arrives in Jerusalem, small, tired, but purposeful, united, and ready for the task before them. And when they get back, they find Jerusalem was a rubble. The city had been so completely destroyed that the place had been so, the place was deserted, no one had even started to clean up. If you can remember that Jerusalem was a rubble, you can always remember the leader of the first person, the first group back, whose name was Zerubbabel. I learned that when I was a boy in Sunday school. I thought that was corny. But I have to admit <laughs> that I have indeed always remembered. And so they got started. And where they got started was to build the altar and to establish the principle of the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice before the Lord. Everything starts with the altar. The Lord God said that there, was only gonna be, there would only be one altar on which Israel would offer sacrifices. From the time of the tabernacle, there was only one. There were not going to be altars built all over the place. That was the way the heathen worshipped. That was the way the world worshipped. For the Lord... There was one altar. Jesus said it was the altar that sanctified the gift. There was one place to come to God. You couldn't make up your own. You could not build your own. There was one gate into the courtyard of the tabernacle, one way into the holy place, one altar at which to worship. It's not hard to get the point. Again, with the reference to the two ways series, there's a narrow gate and a narrow way. And as Joshua Gorman said, they are connected. The gate comes first. You don't get on the narrow way without going through the narrow gate. And that gate is Jesus Christ. And that altar is Jesus Christ. Well, with the altar in place, the people turned to building the temple. And that's where the trouble started. 
because the people who had moved into the land during the captivity did not like what they were seeing. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in the building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, and even to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. See what these people did? They hired lawyers. That's what they did. (laughs) They hired lawyers. Send lawyers guns and money, right? Wasn't that a song in the 70s? They hired lawyers. As the phrase goes, they got lawyered up. I'll tell you, if you ever want to make sure nothing gets done, you go hire a lawyer. We are the only profession that gets paid to make sure nothing happens. And some of us, by the way, are very good at it. (laughs) Now, just a word about the history of Ezra 4. The chronology of Ezra 4 runs from verse 5, verse 4 to verse 5, and then directly to verse 24. This is because there is what I will call a great big footnote from verse 6 all the way through verse 23. And the chronology can be confusing unless that you know that unless you know that it's there. Ezra is explaining that getting lawyered up was the common practice of their opponents. They did it here during the reign of Cyrus. They did it, says Ezra in his footnote, during the reign of Arasaurus. They did it again during the reign of Artaxerxes. They were doing it all the time. Now, this was clearly evident to Ezra's immediate audience. They understood this was a footnote because Cyrus and Arasaurus and Artaxerxes and Darius were household names, and it would be for us saying it was Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. Everybody knew who they were. But unless you are fluent in this succession of Persian rulers, it can get confusing. So the main line of the history runs from verse 5 directly to verse 24. Their lawyers do a great job of making sure that nothing gets done. The work stops. The people lose interest. They start to work on other things, building their homes, building their farms, planting their vineyards. And thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued. The next verse, chapter 5, verse 1, introduces us to that odd couple that I described at the outset of our discussion. Then the prophet Haggai And Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. The time span between those two verses, Ezra 4.24 and Ezra 5.1, is 15 years. 536 to 520 B.C. Fifteen years, a sort of nothing happening. Now, they thought there was a lot happening. They were building their houses, they were building roads, they were building farms, they were getting life cleaned up, they were getting back to normal. But as far as God was concerned, nothing was happening. And for many people, and for many Christians, that's a description of their life. They think there's a lot going on. Your career is going along. Your family is growing up. But maybe from God's perspective, nothing is happening. And speaking honestly, that's also the description of some churches. Somehow the work stops. The meetings are still going on, but the people have stopped working. Never confuse religion and faith. Religion is something that you do by routine. Faith is something that breaks out of the routine to define and to change your life. The Spirit of God covers 15 years in one verse. Work stopped, nothing happened. Until the second year of Darius. But in the second year of Darius, there would be a sudden explosion. So turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Haggai, very end of the Old Testament, get to the end of the Old Testament, work backwards, you'll quickly find Haggai, 
And let's look at the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1 begins, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. May the Lord bless as we consider his word. Let's do some preliminaries. You can see right away that the second year of Darius is going to be meticulously detailed. The sixth month, the first day of the month. The Bible is remarkable for the accuracy of its history, shown again and again in the Old and the New Testament. These are not stories for children of all ages. These are not, to quote the Apostle Peter, cunningly devised fables. Fables start with the words, once upon a time. Fiction starts with words like, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. This starts with, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. To read the Bible as anything less than real history is to vastly underestimate its narrative and its power. For Haggai himself, we get no introduction, no genealogy, not even the name of his father. The name Haggai means born on the feast day. Now, I know that uh, the women recently had a study on the feast days of Israel. They were the feasts of Jehovah that were described in the books of Moses. Haggai is born on one of them, so you can think of Haggai as the Yankee Doodle Dandy of, uh, he, of Hebrew prophets, you know, born on the 4th of July. Haggai is a very old man. So records Jewish history, and it appears from chapter 2, verse 3, that he had seen Solomon's temple before it was destroyed. That makes him in his 80s, maybe even 90 years old. Haggai is extremely plain spoken. There is no subtlety, there is no ambiguity in his message. It is laser focused on one thing, and that's building the temple. Over these last 15 years, you have built your houses, and they're very nice with paneled walls. And you've established and cultivated your farms, and they're large and well-watered, and you've sown much, but you have neglected the house of the Lord. And so in all your doings, you have not done this. You gave it up at the first opposition. You said that you don't have time, but you find time for everything else. And so we read in verses 5 and 7, consider your ways. Think about what you're doing, or maybe I should say, think about what you're not doing. You go through your life doing whatever you want, giving no more than lip service to God, and yet you expect him to bless you. You expect him to be there when you're in trouble. You expect him to fill your life with good things. Haggai says that thinking is stupid at best and downright insulting to God at worst. And so for all you're running around, what has it gotten you? 
You eat, but you're not full. You're clothed, but you're not warm. You earn wages to put into a bag with holes. There's a phrase for 21st century America. You earn wages to put into a bag with holes. Why, says Haggai? Because you built your, your farms and your houses and your careers and you've just ignored the Lord or explained them away. And so now, says Haggai, it's time for renewal. It's time to recapture the passion that brought you back from Babylon. It's time to recapture that vision that brought you back. Not that you're going to have your own house and your own farm, but you came back to respond to the Spirit of God and to be part of His work. You came here to make a new start. Time to make it new again. Go up into the mountains. Bring wood. Build the temple. Honor the Lord. Then watch what happens. Let me say out loud what I think you already gleaned from these verses, because it is not hard to draw a modern Christian application from this ancient text. The Christian life is one of renewal, ongoing renewal. Renewal is implicit and inherent in the work of God that saves us by grace and through faith. For Paul writes to Titus that salvation comes not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, that having been justified by his grace we should become heirs of the hope of eternal life. We read in Romans that just as Israel in the days of Haggai offered sacrifices to God upon the altar, so we offer our own bodies, our own form and dimensions, which is itself the temple of the Holy Spirit. And our lives are not to be conformed to this world, but transformed, and how? By the renewing of your mind. It is an ongoing, conscious, cleansing, restorative activity. David prayed to the Lord to renew him in a steadfast spirit. Isaiah saw it as he, as he waited on the Lord so that he could run and not be weary, weary, walk and not be faint. Paul wrote that we are renewed in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and even though our outward man is failing, the inward man is renewed day by day. Haggai, as he stood before the people, was a living demonstration of that. An old man failing, the inward man renewed day by day. Indeed, if we are not renewed, if we are not renewed individually, if we are not renewed as a church, then we will lose heart. We will become weary on the journey and faint on the way, and the knowledge of Christ will grow dim, and we will find our lives conformed to the world and our own temple left desolate. My Christian life is not one of perfection. I am not going to stand up here and pretend that I'm some great Christian. It is rather a life of renewal. It may be littered with failures and beset with distractions, and yet when we turn again unto Christ, we find anew the strength to go up to the mountains to restore our purpose, and to find again the joy of our salvation. And Haggai is remarkable in the annals of the prophets for a very obvious but often overlooked fact, which is that the people actually listened to him. They wouldn't listen to Isaiah or Jeremiah, and they mocked the messengers of God and despised his word and scoffed at his prophets, but they listened to Haggai. In terms of his response rate, he is the most successful of all the Old Testament prophets. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. 
So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord their God on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. The precision of the movement of the heavens allows us to determine exactly when was that 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of Darius. It was, as I alluded to earlier, 2,539 years, seven months, and two, two weeks, and two days ago. It was, I suppose, a day that dawned like any other day. The sun rose in the sky, the clouds gathered, the winds blew. But that day is recorded and remembered because the people made it a day of renewal. And the decision that you make in one day can impact the remainder of your life. I remember reading Charles Dickens' novel, Great Expectations being struck with the words of the narrator, Pip, reflecting back on one day early in his life. That was a memorable day for me, for it made great changes in me. But it is the same with any life. Imagine one selected day struck out of it. Think of your own life and days when your life hinged, strike out, just one day out of your life, and think how different its course would have been. Pause, you who read this, and consider for a moment the long chain of iron or gold, of thorns or flowers, that never would have bound you, but for the formation of the first link on one memorable day. And with this, the Bible agrees. The Apostle Paul wrote that salvation happens in a day. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Moses called Israel to remember the day of their freedom. Remember this day. Joshua called Israel to choose this day who you will serve. And Haggai recorded the day when renewal came for the building of the temple in Jerusalem. Just one more thought, and then we'll be done for this day. The book of Psalms is famously a collection of poems and songs. Some of them are joyful, others are sad, others are reflective. But at the end of the book of Psalms, there is a collection of five, Psalm 146 to 150, that are different from all the others and are wholly celebratory. There is in them no confession, no exhortation, no cry for help, just shouts of joy and praise and celebration to God. And none of them bear the famous names that you associate with the Psalms. They're known by David or Solomon or the sons of Korah. And according to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, that was begun in the third century before Christ in Alexandria by 70 scholars, that's the name Septuagint, actually there were 72, but they used 70. Those Psalms, 146 to 150, were all written for the dedication of that new temple that was begun in earnest in the second year of Darius. And according to the scholars of the Septuagint, Psalms 146 through 149 were written by Haggai. Now, I don't know, but they thought so. And in reading these psalms, that makes sense. They sound like the words of a man in the hearty winter of old age, to borrow a phrase from Her Herman Melville, a man who now values every day of his remaining life. They sound like a man who in his youth 
have maybe seen the temple destroyed and hope destroyed, but they sound like an old man who can look back over his life and see how God has been true to his promises and how he's preserved his people until this day and has restored what seemed to be irredeemably lost in the days of Ramoth. And so, maybe, here are the words of Haggai as that temple goes up. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praises to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king, for the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening to me today. This morning is the sixth month and renewal. Next Sunday, we're going to turn to events in the seventh month. And our key word is going to be remembrance. So you can read ahead to the sec second year of Darius and the seventh month. Let's pray, and then we'll be done for today. Our Father, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, like those people coming back, we pray that we would humble ourselves before you that you would show us the right way for us to go and for our little ones. We thank you, Father, for your spirit dwelling within us. We thank you, Father, for your word which instructs us. And we thank you that we are called again and again to renewal. And Lord, we pray that we would take courage and strength from this and that the Lord Jesus Christ would be glorified in our lives individually, in our own bodies, and in our work together, that this temple, built of living stones, would be a place where you are pleased to dwell and from which your word goes. We pray as we consider the different activities of our chapel, for the work among the young people, for the series starting on Saturday nights, for the plans for the summer, and as we, Lord, begin anew, we pray that there would be a, uh, an open door for the preaching of the gospel, that people would be renewed, that people would be saved. We give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and our meeting is dismissed.